Hello and welcome back to another Ask GTN, but this time we are talking all things bike. We are, and we have had some great questions in from you, which Mark and I are going to dive right into now. Yes, yeah, so this first one here from jbur 19 says, how do I shift gears properly on the bike? I know it sounds silly, but I come from a swimming background where there's no technical stuff involved, and I'm not sure how to get it quite right. Do I shift before or during the hill, and do I do the first do, do I first do the chain set and then the cassette or both at the same time? You can see that I'm lost. Well, firstly, I do think that if you, if you think that swimming isn't very technical, well, you're, you're very lucky because I'm sure there's a lot of viewers out there that will disagree with you. Yes. But back to your question, and you're certainly not silly because I've witnessed a lot of people changing gears at the bad or incorrect time. Yeah, I mean, you really first things first have to differentiate between our chainings at the front, a cassette at the back, and decide in your head what you're going to go for first. Yeah, so I think on a really steep hill, you want to drop into that small chain ring first and then work through the gears. You definitely don't want to be doing both at once because not only will you get a massive jump in the gears, there is also the risk of actually jamming the gears and having a bit of a mechanical. So you actually want to be really gentle with the gears, any movement that you make. So you're not going through the whole cassette range at one time, you're just going through one, two, maybe even three at a time and just doing it nice and gently. And also when you're not putting too much pressure through the chain. So it's a really interesting topic we've discussed before about when you're going up hills, what do you do when you want to change gear? Yeah, and Mark makes that point really clear. And I've been there and done that, is grabbing gears really quickly when you see a hill, because you panic, don't you? And you think, goodness, I've got to go up that hill. I'm not in the right gear. I need to be in an easier gear. And, and, and hit your um, shifter to try and grab all those gears too quickly. And that's when you can get the problems with chain either falling off the back of the cassette, getting stuck between the cassette and the spokes, or equally dropping the chain at the front when the uh, when it falls off the from the big to the small chain ring. Yeah, so also when you are going up a hill, I normally suggest actually sitting down when you are gonna change gear because what happens is when you're standing up out of the saddle, you're putting a lot of pressure and strain through that chain, which then is gonna make it harder to move through the cassette. So sit down, take a little bit of pressure off, change the gears quickly, and then put that pressure back on. But next question um, we have from Paul Cartridge says, is there any sign behind the benefits of keeping cool with a fan on the turbo trainer, thus allowing you to put out more watts versus not using a fan to train in effectively hotter conditions. I only race in the UK, so interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I would always want to use a fan to answer that question really quickly. I understand having the turbo set up in the house to try and feel like you're working harder because you might be racing, but well, he actually is not. He's only racing in the UK, so the chances of it being really warm in the UK are actually pretty slim. Um, that being said, what happens when we're in the indoor turbo, I guess, is it's about extra stress, isn't it, on the body? Yeah. And sometimes it's good to just make that stress just a little bit more bearable, and that's where the fan's good, I think. Well, definitely. I mean, let's, let's take it back a step here, because the reason that we sweat, well, perspire, is to kind of dissipate heat from the body. Our body's doing that on purpose, but if we are riding outside, the wind is almost evaporating that sweat mm. away, so that's adding to that cooling effect. If we allow that sweat just to sit on us, we are going to boil, and what we see is when we start to get hot and overheat, we have a lower output and less power coming out on the bike. So if you are training in those conditions all the time on a turbo, you're probably not going to be getting that much from your session. You might adapt to an extent, but probably not overall for you your get hot really turbo. good at doing a hot turbo indoors <laughs> yeah definitely maybe not for your race yeah. performance and if you are racing in the UK as Fraser said just scrap it train hard put a fan on and do it well now this next question is actually in reference to one of our recent videos on whether we should ride harder into headwinds or easier and this is what we had to say in that video we could go into some complicated science right now but we're going to stick to the facts that have been successfully tried and tested already by the pros it was actually Graham O'Brien, the former one-hour record holder, who previously stated that it's not the person that goes the fastest that wins, it's the person who slows down the least that wins. In other words, it's really important as triathletes to maintain or keep our average speed up throughout our ride rather than peaking for some sections and then stalling for others. And if you think about it, when we are riding into headwinds, obviously we're going slower. And that then takes up a large proportion of our overall time on the bike. So if we can increase just by a fraction our speed on that part of the ride when we're going into the headwinds, we're actually increasing our pace 
for a large proportion of the race. And off the back of that, we have Marat Guk asking us, does this principle apply to climbing as well? And I mean by that, is it better to work harder whilst climbing and take it easier whilst rolling on the flats? Yeah, really good question actually. And in a way, yes, because if you are riding with a power meter, you'll probably notice a natural increase in your power even if you are trying to maintain the same effort level. So my theory behind this, and a few other clever folk out there have said the same, although there is a bit of debate as to whether this is true, but it's uh, to do with our pedal stroke and how much pressure we're applying through the whole pedal stroke. See, when we're riding on the flat, we often put pressure through the downstroke and not so much on the upstroke. Whereas when we're on the climb, we put pressure through the whole pedal stroke. Otherwise, we'll pretty much just fall off our bike and come to a grinding halt. So that accounts for something like a 20 to 30 watt increase, just generally speaking for some people. Um, but should we ride harder on the climbs? Now I tend to just ride harder. That's my go-to, what do you do? Yeah, well we attack them, don't we? I think that's just human nature. See a hill, go harder. And that's actually a really good point. I mean, there's the psychological side to it. You see a hill and like attack and that's exciting and you get an adrenaline from that. Well, most people do, whether it's fear or But uh, it or also depends on how long that climb is. It's a very good point. And also sort of the race that you're doing. So is it is it a Olympic distance race? in which you could go balls to the wall and really hard, or could you? is it an Ironman race where you need to maybe conserve your effort a little bit more? Yeah, and I think there's also, I like to think of, it's about, um, especially when you're talking about shorter sprint and Olympic distances, it's almost about con or maintaining or conserving the momentum you've, you've built up. And if those climbs are short, punchy ones, which we get a lot of here in the UK, you can, afford almost to override that power cap that you might have put on, on a hill beforehand because, well, it's worth it in the long run of the race. Yeah, and that cap idea is a really good sort of way of saying it. I mean, I normally say something like a 10% cap if you're maybe doing like a half Ironman, Ironman, because you want to conserve that energy. If you're doing a shorter race where you can afford to get a little bit harder, put some sort of like a 10 to 20 or maybe 10 to 15% cap on that intensity on the climbs. But very good question. Now this next one here from Stephen Rees. Can you guys do a video on how to choose a size for a TT or triathlon bike? I read online that people typically size down when going from a road to TT, but that could be old school information. Now, I've got to say, I used to give that advice and used to do very similar. I used to ride a 58 centimeter road bike and then ride a 50, well, the equivalent of a 56 centimeter TT bike. I now actually ride a 56 centimeter road bike, but that's irrelevant now. What do you do? I'm just wondering if we're showing our age here and that we're just quite old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I came into the sport, definitely it was the same. It was, you know, a smaller bike is better because that might be lighter. You can be a little bit more aero perhaps. And I definitely think there's been a change in thinking now. And um, well, it's also the brands as well. There's yeah. a whole, the, the geometry is kind of adjusted for TT bikes. It was, TT bikes used to be, well, kind of just an add-on to their range. And the, the sizes, geometries were really thought about they're all adjusted now and actually you are mostly buying tt bikes in a small medium and large so mm -hmm. it's, it's completely different and what i would say with tt bikes is that the position is so important it's actually best to try and see the bike beforehand whether that's going to a bike shop check the bike out get fitted up take measurements and actually find the size that fits you and if possible sit on that bike beforehand yeah that is a really good point but it is obviously a tricky thing to do because it's hard to go and see two bikes and different sizes in one place. But if you can, I think it would be an ideal way. I mean, I always rode a medium frame on pretty much the same type of bike. And I do wish maybe I'd even be able to sit on a large and just have a try and see what that felt like, because to be honest, I never did and, and never had that comparison to make. Yeah, I would actually, just to add to that, I always used to go for a slightly smaller frame. And actually now, if I wish I'd known actually, I should have been extending out a bit further, which I probably couldn't have done on those smaller bikes. Yeah. So. Very important. Okay, well, next question from Jasper W said, when cycling here in the north of the Netherlands, I never use my smaller chainring up front. Would it be crazy to just have one chainring up front and save weight of that extra ring and front derailleur? I mean, I would firstly say, lucky you that you don't need a small chainring because <laughs> I wish where I've spent most of my time training, I didn't need one. Yeah, well, to answer your question, no, not at all. I mean, people are gonna really disagree with me here. We've had had some hate haters for the single chain ring idea, but if you are, if the course does allow, then definitely single chain ring if you can, but you just need to make sure that the gearing is correct for that course. And we've actually seen loads of the top cyclists, time trial specialists, and even many of the top pros going for this single chain ring option. 
But what you do need to make sure that you do is that you get a narrow wide chain ring. So this there is basically longer teeth on the chain ring, which stops the chain from then just falling off as you're going through the gears. Um, another thing to maybe take into consideration is that gearing and we have seen some pretty crazy gears as of late so a lot of the pros at Kona the male pros in particular are riding over 55 tooth chain rings yeah they're getting what I think are enormous sizes to be honest because I'm a little bit old school and still think of 53 chain rings quite <laughs> but yeah I mean it's, it's very good going mate. <laughs> thanks but um yeah I think it is definitely becoming more popular I mean I do actually remember a race last year being passed by a guy Jordan Rapp riding on a 1 by 11 a single chain ring and um, it just it, it seems strange but definitely gonna happen more. yeah well we saw um Joe Skipper Kona on a 62 62 yeah it's pretty big, big. Um, but this is all to do with chain line efficiency which uh, Matt Bottrell explains here a 60 tooth chain rings to a lot of our viewers will sound absolutely nuts but what is the idea behind that again it's all about chain line efficiency so if we can say you know if we're not we've not got these massive crossovers then we're gonna ultimately save uh, save drag so you know, it might be a couple of watts that we're going to save by having the correct chain line. And our next question from Derman, who asks us, are there any TT handlebars that take MTB brakes? Yeah, I think the answer to that is no. Never, I've never seen it. Yeah, I've never <laughs> seen it. Uh, I'm not sure why you want it, but yeah, it's, it's a niche market. I would like to see it. Um, they, you can, however, get hydraulic brakes for TT bikes. I've actually got set on my um, Cervelo P5X. We've got the SRAM Aero HRD hydraulic brakes, which are very powerful. So if you're looking for that side of the technology for mountain biking, it is there. Works Oops. well. Yeah. yeah. Now I've got a big question coming up now from Fuji Wuji. Wuji? Fuji Wuji. Um, I don't understand the idea behind allowing bars only as long as your brake levers. Is there some advantage that the longer ones offer that the short ones don't? And if so, why would the, the race organizers bother and make them insist that triathletes only use shorter ones? It goes on and on. But basically, we're talking about the shorter draft legal bars that you see in ITU racing. Mm. So, I mean, it, it, it's the rules for, for ITU racing and short course racing. There is no um, plane that can extend past the edge of our brake hoods, that'd be a good yep. way to describe it. So you see, um, if you're ever to watch the um, athletes, uh, you know, getting themselves ready to go through transition, there'll be um, referee making sure they'll have a, like a block of wood that'll get put towards the uh, front of the bike and just literally see whether those um, handlebar extensions go go past your brake. If they do, you're we not. We won't share the uh, tricks to cheating that one. Though, no, another video. Yeah, that's another video. But anyway, but the, yeah, I, I think the idea, I say I think, I'm pretty sure I know the idea behind keeping them short it is for safety really um, you you if by having the longer bars your hands are quite far away from the brake levers so if you do suddenly need to grab those brakes because you are in a pack and draft legal racing it's a long way to go whereas the from the shorter bars they're just there it's a it's a small bit but but it's also some I mean you're absolutely right but it's also the fact that that's a little bit of a weapon the longer it gets exactly so if you do crash or multiple bikes come down then you just don't want an extra thing protruding yeah and then I guess you could also talk about the race dynamics as well is that um, it would probably completely change the race dynamics if everyone had these long TT bars on, so they're time trialing through what should have been a draft legal race. The draft legal bit is the fun part of draft legal mm. racing, so let's keep that there and don't turn it into a time trial. And our next question from Austin Blair is, I thought pedal self-loosened. Yeah, well this is quite a good one to finish on, and it is in reference to a video made quite a while back about how to install and remove your pedals. Yeah, and I guess what we're driving at here is it's easy to think when we're pedaling in the, the, the forward direction that we, we're moving the cranks in our pedals that in theory that the spindles can loosen. Yeah, effectively come out of our cranks. But that, well, what do you think? Well, actually it is due to an effect called precession that actually means that they don't self-loosen. In fact, they actually self-tighten. Or, or maybe they don't self-tighten, they just, they just don't loosen. Because mm. what is happening is although like you say, we're pedaling in that direction they could loosen. The bearings within them, within the spindle area, mm. are actually going the opposite direction. So we don't get that, that loosening effect. So really, if I mean, I have seen pedals come off bikes. I mean, it can happen, but that's either- See, I've not. That's but... either because they've sheared and there's a proper problem, <laughs> or you've just not put them on properly in the first place. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, like the beginning of a training camp, uh, maybe you don't put your pedals on that tight. You think, oh, I'll get these off really easily. By the end of the training camp, after a week or two, 
they're always tighter. You always need to get help, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, I wonder what would happen if you actually cycled backwards. Maybe they would eventually come off. That's too confusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, that was great fun. We loved going through all of your questions there. And please do keep sending them in, whether it's swim, bike, or run. We love reading through them and answering them for you. Um, now, if you like this video, hit that thumbs up button. And if you'd like to see more videos from GTN, you can click on the globe and subscribe. And for a video about riding into a headwind, you can click here. And if you'd like to see our triathlon versus TT bike with Match Bottrell, then just click down there.